straight for those of you who do not know who I am. I'm Jeff Filardi. I am professor and director, and I coordinate this lecture series. Uh, so thanks for attending tonight's lecture. Uh, keep an eye out for um, the remaining lectures. There's another one next week um, by Dr. Josh Taylor of the University. Um, tonight's event is presented by Dr. Colin Schaffner, a much better director um, and professor compared to me. Uh, she is a director for the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and professor of psychology. Dr. Schaffner is a biological psychologist trained in animal behavior, psychology, behavioral endocrinology, criminology, and has experience working in conservation biology. She has a strong research career with over 80 publications, the majority of which are in peer-reviewed outlets, and is a world-recognized expert on spider monkey behavioral ecology and conflict management and vi uh, vision fusion dynamics in non-human primates. Lately, she has turned her attention away from all things spider monkeys and leaned into her newest role as leader of the psychology department and as director for the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. She serves on the board of the Colorado and Wyoming Network of Women Leaders and is a director of their leadership training program, um, the Academic Management Institute. Dr. Schaffner has been engaged in exploring effective ways to help colleagues navigate change her leadership style encompasses radical and unseizable change. She values servant leadership learning and compassionate leadership and tries her best to wield them in her day-to-day -day work. Tonight's lecture is about teaching, leading, and working through a pandemic, um, which was not easy in higher ed. More than half a million colleagues lost their jobs in higher ed. And in addition, 50 to 60 percent of her colleagues experienced greater mental health issues. In the aftermath of COVID-19, many faculty, staff, and executives in higher education are now experiencing compassion fatigue, which stems from physical, emotional, and psychological impacts of helping others. Often through experiences, the experiences of stress and burnout. Thus, leading with the compassion now is more important than ever. Organizations that lead Partner more efficiently and work and be better at retaining their employees. She will explore simple steps to create a more compassionate workplace. So help me in welcoming Dr. Schaffner. I forgot that I wanted a marker, so hang on. Didn't really want to come out of that little bag. Thank you for that, Jess. I think I make it, I didn't know you're gonna read the whole abstract, so now I can skip over a lot of slides so that'll work in my favor. Yay. All right. So before I start, I want to do the land acknowledgement statement. And remember, I'm gonna give it in English and Spanish, and then we're gonna revisit why did I do that, okay? So we, the Adams State University community, gratefully acknowledge the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands we gather. This beautiful San Luis Valley is sacred to many indigenous nations, including the Utes, Hickorilla, <coughs> sorry, Hickorilla, Apaches, Comanches, Kiowas, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Navajo Nation, Pueblos, and all other first peoples who once made this valley their home. We honor the diverse communities that historically dwelled here and those who currently reside in the San Luis Valley. We know that honoring these lands is a reflective process that demands continued engagement and action. May we always remember the journey of the past peoples who called this valley home. Nosotros, la comunidad de Adams State University, reconocemos con gratitud a los pueblos indígenas en cuyas tierras ancestrales nos juntamos. Este hermoso valle de San Luis es sagrado para diversas naciones indígenas, incluidos los Utahs, pueblos, Apaches, Jicarilla, Comanches, Kiowas, Arapahos, Cheyennes, Navajos y todos los otros pueblos originarios que creaban a un hogar en este valle. 
Honoramos a la diversidad de comunidades que históricamente moraban aquí y a aquellos que hoy en día viven en Valle de San Luis. Sabemos que honorar a las tierras es un proceso reflexivo que demanda un continuo compromiso y acción. Sí que recordemos siempre el viaje de los antepasados que llamaban a este valle hogar. Now I need a beverage. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I really appreciate so many of you coming to have this experience with me, and we'll see how it goes. Those of you in the back, if there becomes a moment when you can't hear me, will you yell at me, please? Okay, thank you. All right, now I want you to just take a moment and think of or write down words that immediately come to mind when I say leadership. What do we got? Servant. Okay. Team. Team. Overwhelmed. 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 What, 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 to overwhelm it. Sorry. You're doing really well. Yep. Risk taking. Risk taking. Really nice. Guidance. Guidance. We have a room full of really good leaders in here. Well, you're not doing at all what I expect. I expected you to say things like, you know, strategic planning, <laughs> stuff in that venue. But those are good. Those are really good. So a lot of times when you ask people those words, you get these other words like strategic planning or, you know, performance indicators and how are you doing. But um, one of the people I've been reading a lot of lately is Brene Brown, and she's done work with... Um, the Air Force quite a bit, and she went back in time because what she sees now in all their like leadership handbooks and guidance is things like strategic planning. And there's nothing wrong with strategic planning. I don't mean to bash it or anything, but when she looked at the original first document that they came out with in 1948, these were the words that kept coming up over and over and over again. Humanness, compassion, kindness, sense of belongingness, mercy. Not what you really think you're going to see from the Air Force. And I think we need to go back to some of these ideas in our leadership. So these are just some that come up for me over and over again. And then one of the little exercises Brene Brown has you do is identify the one word that resonates most with you as a leader. So first, obviously, I'm talking about compassion today, so I'm trying to wield compassion in my day-to-day -day life as a leader. Empathy. Empathy feeds compassion, so that's important to me, too. Being courageous and brave so I can take risks. Being vulnerable. So I think it's really important to be able to be vulnerable with your team. Great things don't happen without that kind of self-risk and vulnerability. I also am now like radically loving this phrase, radical transparency. So I really like radical transparency too. And my single most important word for me is learning. That is like if you ask me why I'm here, like on the planet, 
it's to learn. And when I think about my leadership, all of these things are going to help me learn. That's just for me, like, to figure out why I'm here. I think I'm here to learn stuff. So why compassion now? Because, you know, Jess just told you all those things, like, really, um, like, that's a monkey rubbing, scent marking a branch, and that's a mama with her baby, and that's the logo for our NGO. And all this week, I was like, Carl, why did you decide to give a talk on something you basically know nothing about? Because I've only been thinking about this really for a year. I've been thinking about them for 23 years. And also, if I come in a room, any room, and talk about them, I know more than everyone else. I don't know more than anywhere else, anybody else about compassion and leadership, that's for sure. So I'm going to be a little vulnerable tonight, practicing one of those terms, by talking about compassionate leadership. But I'm also going to be more than just a little bit vulnerable, I'm going to be a lot vulnerable, because I'm going to spill my guts right now about why I'm talking about compassionate leadership. And that's because in the last, well, before, I would say 21, 22, I didn't do a, as good a job as I thought I should do in my day-to-day -day leadership. And I had some bad conversations with people where I did not do things well. I did not leverage my compassion correctly. And I caused pain in others and pain in myself. And so I decided if I'm going to keep doing this job, I got to do a little bit better. So that's why I'm talking about this. I could, get, I could throw more guts on the table if that helps, but I think that's <laughs> enough for now. All right, another reason why now is because of COVID, as Jess alluded to. So in 2020, we had this little problem. And that affected those of us at Adams quite a bit. We had to pivot and teach a different way. If we were students, we had to learn a different way. If that wasn't enough, we had to form schools when we were all happy in our autonomous little departments. So that wasn't good. So that abstract gave away some of this, so I can go kind of fast through this. But there's a lot, a lot going on. So 650,000 colleagues have lost their jobs in higher education. That's a, a lot of people. We have um, enrollment dropping rather precipitously as a function of COVID. So if you look over here, we take everybody together. This is 21, 22. We're down 1%. A little bit more here. Actually, it's even worse. It's going to get sad before it gets better. Okay? So, Changes in number of students enrolling in college after high school by high school characteristics. This is fall of 2019, so there's a little dip. This is fall of 2020. I just want to draw your attention to some of these dropping down bars. Okay, so the first one is low income schools. So these are kids going to low income high schools. And where are we? We are in Di Valley, where people don't have a lot of money. The second one is high minority schools. We have high minority schools in the valley, so we're hit, hit ouch, again. And then that, that one is um, high poverty schools. So we're in a high poverty area. We're one of the highest poverty areas in the country. So we felt everything worse. And if that's, you know, that's not enough, I'm not happy unless I bring data, right? So um, here's some more. Down in undergrad enrollment, about 3% in fall of 21. This is going a little further, right? So this is fall of 22, not down too bad. Fall of 20 to 22, we drop overall 4.2% and 3.2% for grad. 
if we just look at less selective public four-year institutions, that's Adams. If you didn't know that, that's Adams. Okay, we're less selective, which is a wonderful thing why we're all here. Right, but ouch. We're down 9.3% in women and 7.5% in undergraduate enrollment overall across the country in less selective institutions. So that's just not good. Okay, this is the only happy thing I could find. In the aftermath of COVID, students decided 10% more than usual decided it's better to stay in the same state and 11% more than normal thought it would be a good idea to be within 50 miles of home. So in that way, that like, helps us a little, offset some of that big downfall. So that's, that's one problem. And then I, I'm sure you remember the whole pivot thing, those of you who teach, right? And we had an experience just like this, right? So you turn on your screen while you're pivoting and teaching online in post spring break, of spring of 2020, and everyone is there, right? They're there, and they're smiling. Look at that, they're smiling. And oh, can I answer that question, please? <laughs> please, please, let it be me. That's not how it was, though. It was like this. Where, where are you? Where are you? I was having the most magical class of my professional life in evolutionary psychology. It's like we couldn't even get through a slide. The dialogue was so great and of such a high level, I just kind of sat there and felt like I was just like a little facilitator, really. They had it all. They were doing it. I didn't have to do anything. It was magic. Went to this. No, crickets. And I became the most boring person on the planet. So did you understand what I said? Crickets. Nothing. Are you following me? Horrible. I would sign off, curl up on the sofa, and cry. So, not surprisingly, 50 to 60 percent of our colleagues experienced greater mental health issues. There was isolation. So, remember Corey? Remember when this first happened? The Corey's friend of mine. We would leave food on each other's doorstep just to have social contact. My neighbor, Roxy, is right there. We wave across the street. I made friends with her new baby without ever like even seeing her face, really. So there was a lot of isolation. There's job insecurity. Increased workload. We all remember spring of, uh, sorry, fall of 20, compressed semester. We're going we're gonna to finish a Thanksgiving. We're all still going to do the same work, and we're all going to do it in 25% less time. And then there was just the general anxiety and stress related to the pandemic. So there's a lot of personal toll. And this really, this, this could be a whole talk on its own and probably something I'm going to somehow get someone to help me pursue next year. But this is the impact on students. And this isn't the impact during COVID. This study was done in January and February of 2022. These are how students scored in fear before COVID-19, after COVID-19. How they scored in happiness on a happiness scale before, after COVID-19. And this is, remember, 2022. This is not 2020. So there's a <coughs> negative correlation there between change in fear and happiness. Here, these same students filled out a psychological symptoms rating scale, which I can't remember its fancy name off the top of my head, but that's what it did. Asked some questions about depression and anxiety and interpersonal insecurities. So just think what high school was like for those students. Some, of, some people in here don't have to think they lived it, right? Everything was remote. So. They experienced over 96% experienced moderate to severe mental health issues two years on. And the final question, they were asked on a scale of zero being did not adversely affect my learning abilities at all to 10 catastrophically impacted my ability to learn. This is where we're landing. 
So we're still, we're still in it. It might, be, it might be endemic and not pandemic, but it's still a problem. And we're still dealing with those echoes of that situation even now. And I'm going to start with compassion fatigue instead of compassion because, well, I think for me, part of the problem I wasn't doing my good job bringing my compassion as well as I should have in the 21-22 um, school year might have had something to do with this, right? Like I might have had a little bit of burnout of asking everybody to put their mask on every day. I might have had a little bit of burnout my patience with people when I really should have been doing much better. And it's probably true for many of us. So compassion fatigue happens because we get tired. The physical, emotional, psychological impact of helping others through crisis, trauma, everybody needed more. There wasn't necessarily more to go around. And we all of us probably have some burnout from that Maybe it's going away now. We had other issues at this institution that were just amplifying all of that. So that's part of the reason for why compassion leadership now. And then just to give a definition of compassion, this is the feeling that comes when faced with the suffering of another and that concomitant motivation to do something to address it. So you know, I, I, you probably can see on an emotional level why it might matter, right? But what, why might it matter to the senior management team? And I'll get there. Oh, oops. They got in there. It's hard for me to leave them behind. Spider monkeys like to embrace. And part of, part of being a compassionate leader is understanding that human social relationships are really critical to people's well-being, both physically and mentally. And this is a um, meta-analysis looking at different factors that increase the mortality rate. And just, Rena, the diet isn't in the meta-analysis, so we can't really say anything about that. Okay, there are some things like BMI and exercise, but nothing adds more years to your life than high-quality, very engaged social relationships with other human beings, okay? Says the woman with three dogs. Okay, very important, That's important for us. And in case, you know, you don't believe me, it's also true for baboons. So they looked at the quality of social relationships between, uh, in females, and they looked at it in terms of their longevity while controlling for a whole lot of other factors. Okay, and the females with the best, highest quality, most complicated, intense, and perfect social relationships lived much longer than those with moderately good ones and really a lot longer than females who did not have good, strong social relationships, independent of rank. So it's not like they're really hierarchical, and yes, if you have a really high rank, you get all the good stuff, but it doesn't do you that much good if you don't have good friends. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Blue Zone studies, these are the different pockets around the world where people regularly live beyond the age of 100. While I could reach each one of these to you and they would highlight something special about each of those areas, the takeaway messages for all of those regions, those individuals living a really long time have high quality social relationships with people that help them and lift them up when they do not feel great or they are facing challenges or having problems. And there are so many people in this room right now that do that for me that I might get emotional. So I'll keep going. All right. Okay, this is still big picture, okay? Different lens. Really important to have the high quality social relationships, but also compassionate leaders perform better, foster more loyalty and engagement from their people. That's a good thing. 
compassionate organizations, that is organizations characterized by these kinds of things that I'm talking about, they have a better bottom line. Those organizations make more money. They're the units in those organizations that practice it are viewed as more valuable by the upper management. They have more customer loyalty, better employee retention, and more creativity. So it's good on the big scale. So it's really important, but it's a little bit challenging too. It's not always easy to do. So, how can we work toward a more compassionate workplace? Well, first, you have to have some compassion for others. If that's not in place, it's going to be a little hard, right? So, these are just four items from the Compassion for Others scale, and I would just ask you to just read each one and see where you fall on here from almost never to almost always. Okay, so here we go, just four, four items. Okay, I pay careful attention when others speak to me. If I see someone going through a difficult time, I try and be caring toward that person. Everyone feels down sometimes, it's part of being human. Despite my differences with others, I know everyone feels pain sometimes. How you doing with that one? Get some people scoring 16 to 20. This requires math in your head, I know, it's a lot. Okay, feeling? I feel like, you know, you're probably all pretty compassionate people to, to others. And so, those of you in my school, we've already, I've already tortured you with this little gimmick. So it's always good just to punch someone once a day, get stuff out. No, that's not what that's about. <laughs> okay, so make a fist. Make it as hard, as hard, as hard, as hard, as hard, as hard as you can. Okay? And now take your other hand and try and pull one of those fingers out. Keeping that fist as tight, as tight, as tight, as tight as you can. Okay? How's that going? Going well? Getting any, getting any traction? Okay. Now take that fist, hard as hard as hard as you can, and hold it with your other hand. What's happening? Anything? How are you doing with that holding it as hard as you can? Any change there? Loosened up. Thank you, Billy. Loosened up. Loosened up a little bit. So think about that when you're approaching other people that you like, you know, you want them to do something, right? So if we go, yes, in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, we are all going to visit every school in the valley tomorrow. That will get you nowhere, right? But if you come at people with compassion and understanding, they're going to always just pleasantly surprise you which is not why my mindfulness coach taught me that, but I, I you know, generalized my learning and apply it in other areas, okay? The hard part, so I think this room, we're probably pretty good with compassion towards others, just a guess, but I'm just thinking we're probably pretty good with that. Okay, let's see how we do with examples from the self compassion scale. I apologize for more working memory math stuff, okay? So same scale, almost never, almost always. Here we go. I try to be understanding and patient towards aspects of my personality that I don't like. When I'm going through a very hard time, I give myself the caring and tenderness I need. How are we doing? Tens across the board so far? Mm. This is reverse scaled, so don't get excited if you get a five, that's not good, okay? <laughs> um, when I'm feeling down, I tend to obsess and fixate on everything that's wrong. The ruminator land, right? Okay, and when I feel inadequate in some way, I try and remind myself that feelings of inadequacy 
are shared by most people. How are we doing? Yay! Good job, Rena. Okay? So, you, you, you know, this, this I, I feel like for some of us, this might be an area for some focus. I know it is for me, because I am horrible to myself. But we'll come back to that. So now, there are some big things, that, there are one big baddie that stands in the way of self-compassion. It works against empathy. In fact, it is the enemy of empathy. And it's something we don't talk a lot about. Except Jeff. And I'm really kind of relieved that he's not here. <laughs> Shame. Shame is the big baddie in my story today. Shame is not embarrassment. Embarrassment is a fleeting thing. It's just like, oh, oops. Shame is deep and nasty. Intense, painful, feeling of believing we are flawed and unworthy of love, belonging, and connection. And it's paralyzing if left unchecked. And it is caustic and cancerous for organizations if it's left unchecked. And when I messed up with those conversations in 2122 with people, I had a lot of this. And there was even some backlash that happened with some of that bad conversations that I had. And when I read those, I was like, yep, that's all fair. That's so true, I don't care. Say it all, I'm horrible. I'm, worth, I'm terrible that I did that. And only after months did I realize, you know what? That could have gone a whole different way, because all I had was bad conversation on a Friday afternoon. It's not that bad. But I made it enormous. But this is what happens with shame. You get, this is only a subset of the things that happen with organizations and people when there's shame. And remember, I had to read both of those land acknowledgement statements. How many people in here speak Spanish? OK, well, maybe it was worth it. There are a few, right? There are a few. I did that because I have this problem. I could not not do it. Like, I had to do it. I had to go in there. My Spanish isn't perfect, but I'm going to practice it like 50 times so that I can kind of say it perfectly here because I have a little problem with perfectionism, which is a sign of shame. Why do I have shame? I grew up in a family that shamed me. Well, why? I wasn't born with a penis, so well, there you go. You're not good enough already. And I was super emotional, and that didn't fly well, so obviously if you're super emotional, you know what? You're not smart. That was the message I got over and over and over again, which, of course, is bullshit. Anyway, that breeds perfectionism in children, which isn't great. Um, if you've got it in your organization, you're going to get a lot of this, some of this, and a lot of this. All that stuff is not good for people. Makes them not want to be at work. Makes them want to leave as soon as they can. Find other things to do, distractions, isolate themselves in their offices, behind a wall where no one can even know when you're in there or not. Not good. We want to vanquish that as much as possible. This is why I was taught about the whole fist thing. So you don't have to do it again. But the whole point why I was taught or shared with about the fist thing was about myself. Like, this is how I am with myself all the time. Hard force myself to do all these things. And maybe I don't even have time, but I'm going to do them all because of that perfectionism problem, right? So it's really the lesson is to start taking care of myself a little bit better, right? And so I have really trained myself to do that. And I've tried to teach myself things like done is better than perfect. And actually walk the talk on that one yet? Well, actually, I'm like late all the time because I want things to be perfect, which is also isn't good either. Okay, so step one is like working on your self-compassion. Because if you want to be a compassionate leader, you have to be compassionate to yourself. So I want you to think a little bit about what, how do you talk to yourself in your head when you make a mistake, when you make a blunder? 
Because if you're doing anything but talking to yourself like someone you really, truly love, like your child or your partner or your naughty golden doodle, <laughs> right? If you're talking any other way than someone you love, like really love, like your best friend, my sister, would I ever speak to the si my sister the way I think to myself when I mess up or do something I don't approve of or exhibit a trait in myself I don't like? I am terrible to myself. I'm better now because I'm working on it, right? But you should be talking to yourself the way you would talk to your very bestest, closest friend. You should be taking and making time for yourself on a regular basis. So when my people, this is psychology because not everybody has to check in with me on every moment, but in psychology, I am totally okay with workouts in the middle of the day, showing up in my gym gear for a department meeting, right? Because I want people to take care of themselves because they're going to like their job better, they're going to stay longer, they're going to be more available for the students, they're going to just do a better job overall. So take care of yourself. Lean into your feelings. Give some space for that. Just process. Don't shelve. Lean in. This one helps me so much. I really practice now daily gratitude. And I could not be more grateful than I am for the people that I work for. I'm really lucky. Among many other things that I practice gratitude for, I do not live in Ukraine. Okay. Let people help you. I'm also terrible at this. Can I help you, Colleen? No, I got it. Elaine, how many times do you ask for help? You ask if I need help. Did you not see my expression? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing everything. Beth. Beth has to like grab it from me and run away. Okay, <laughs> so I'm trying to do better. So now when so, so respond, not react, right? So the minute someone my gut is no, I got it. Right? So now someone asks, Can I help you with this? I'm like, oh, yes. That was yes, 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 help me. Okay. Once you start to grow that self-compassion, it is going to help you bring compassion for others more consistently. So a very good friend of mine who's not here right now told me after I had these terrible conversations in that year, which clearly I'm still processing, um, she said, Colleen, maybe you just don't take meetings on Friday afternoon anymore. Just go home and work from home and just, just avoid people because clearly you're tapped out by then. So now I'm hoping that with self, with my practice of self-compassion, right, that I can now have meetings on Friday afternoon, right, because I'm, I'm doing better taking care of myself, which means I should be able to leverage my care for others better. All right, so this all, step two, now that you've got, you know, the helping yourself, helps you help others, creates a greater capacity to show vulnerability. And all I mean by vulnerability is like, I own when I mess up now. I mean, I, I've all, I kind of always done that because of my you know, self-flagellation personality, really. But I do it in a much more genuine way now, not just a self-loathing self way. So um, it helps with compassion and empathy, which is the emotion, that actually promotes and allows for any compassion at all. So, I can't believe I'm gonna make time. All right. So, we have to develop some skills and grow our toolbox a little bit. So one is cognitive empathy. Then I'm gonna talk about it and you're gonna be like, yeah, yeah, I know that. So this is when we put ourselves in the place, in the position of the other person, put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. That's the first part. So you do that, 
But then you have to take it one step further. You have to imagine what they need to be helped. Not what you, what you need to be helped, because everybody had a different journey. Not everybody has my same experience here at Adams. I came in as chair. Then we needed a director. Ooh, they like me enough, they gave me the director job. I had a pretty good run here. I'm doing good on my teaching, doing good in my science. People appreciate me, mostly, I think. So I can't like just put my, I can't put my, I have to really do the cognitive empathy. Really listen, well, I don't want to get to listen yet. So have that sort of tool ready to execute. Attunement. So this is, these are, some of these things are coming from Brene Brown's book. But the attunement thing that she explained, I didn't get it and had to go to the papers that she cited to really understand it. Because attunement is something you kind of have to do before you engage with the people that you're going to be working with, or the meeting that you're going to go to, or the one-on-one -on -one you're going to have with someone. And it's kind of checking your own, like, how am I feeling? Where am I? Am I in a good space? Do I have any biases that I might be bringing to this meeting that I need to check at the door? Because I just really need to be open and ready to listen and really act, you know, do the cognitive empathy. And before I have a school meeting, because those are scary for me, I do the five minute mindfulness exercise before I go to try and be, you know, in that good space. Then you have to do, once your meeting starts, you have to be an empathetic listener. Not sympathy, oh, I feel so sorry for you. No, no, empathy. And gentlemen, let's listen up here. This is listening without offering solutions. So not when, when the people are coming to you and they're in pain or they're upset, they're not coming for a three-point plan on how to solve the problem. They just want to be heard. And things like, me too, help. But don't go, me too, let me tell you about my situation. Just me too. It's a whole movement, me too, me too. That helps people. You are not alone. Helps people. Mindfulness. So much of this is framed around mindfulness. And I spent a summer working with the mindfulness person who now works, is now working here at Adams. She has helped me find so many gifts, so many tools. Okay? Mindfulness is really just a fancy word for pay attention. 100% pay attention. So now when people, ah, my door is always open unless there's an emergency, right? So I'm doing something, I'm working away, someone comes in my office. I just stop. It's hard, because I really want to get that last piece of the sentence out on my email or finish that little. I just shut the computer and I like go, I have to be 100% mindful of what this person needs. So it also means doing things like being, like this is going to be a hard one to swallow, single tasking. Do one thing at a time. I'm still not doing that very well, but I remind myself, it doesn't mean you just do the one thing all day, but for this hour, I'm going to do this one thing. I don't have to check my email every three seconds. I, do, I, I am so grateful I don't have an Apple Watch. My phone is down there, but it's off. Offish. Airplane mode or whatever, might as well be off. Okay, so, so that's important. And now I've started using something called community agreements. And those of you that are here from my school know all about them because I have, um, I didn't really ask you if, we could, if you wanted to have a community agreement. I said, we're having a community agreement. And that's something from, uh, if you want to know more about it, the National Equity Project has a lot of information on how to have your community agreement. 
But community agreements are agreements that your people, your team make. You do not, I said, we're gonna have a community agreement about how we show up for each other. Everything else was them, not me, okay? Here it is, the community agreement for the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Acknowledging each other with grace, empathy, and patience. Support events that school members put on whenever possible. Lean into our sense of common purpose. Our sense of we're all provide, we're providing a big piece of the liberal arts education here at Adams State in our school. Right? So we have that common purpose. And we've leveraged that this year to also come up with a mission and we're getting somewhere on our vision, but we've got our mission, which also helps create a sense of common purpose. We encourage open discussion and have tolerance for differences. And that's good too, because when you allow for that, you often end up with better solutions, better approaches to all the challenges that we have. And we speak appreciation for what we do and bring to the school. And we try to do that all the time. Like, we have some colleagues whose promotions were approved very recently. I look forward to going out and celebrating with them in the near future. We celebrate the little and the big. Now, this is the perfectionist problem with me. Like, so I made those mistakes and I felt shame and I knew I had to do better and I had to learn how to be a better leader. And so I got some mindfulness help. I started learning about compassionate leadership. And then I'm working with a wonderful person, Jody Barker, who works for the, um, the um, Colorado State University, Col University of Colorado, Denver. Okay, so she's also been helping me be a better leader. So I said, you know, we have the community agreement, not sure it's solving all our problems. How can we do better? So she helped me work through, like, what, which one of these, if we did a drill down, would really make the biggest difference in our school? And I picked this one, solution-oriented problem solving of our issues that come up. And then we really leaned into it. I sent a survey around to everybody in the school. Everybody made suggestions about how we could really leverage that for the best. Then we came into, I'm so annoying. Then we came into a school meeting and we did some individual and small group work on it. And then we fed out in a big group and we came up with another thing that I'm not gonna, you know, torture you with. But basically we came up with ways that we could all agree to do and bring and how we, leverage this one thing to make our lives better as colleagues. And what happens, see if you've been paying attention, what happens if we adopt this one? Solution-focused problem solving. But what are we gonna vanquish in my school? Rhymes with that. Blame. blame. We're getting rid of blame. It doesn't matter. I, I know everybody is doing the best they can. People make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And if you, if you haven't made a mistake this week, maybe you could like join my team of personal coaches. I'm a walking error. Anyway. So it helps us move away from a culture of blame. And when we do that, we create something that's sometimes hard to come by. It creates psychological safety for everybody. If we, w I mean, it doesn't happen overnight, clearly, but it creates psychological safety. It means people don't hide if there's a mistake or an error. Because the goal is not, there's no blame, let's just fix it. Oh, this isn't working. Instead of going, Whose fault is that? Why is that stuff there? What can we do? Why did that person yell at me? Blah, 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 No. Goodbye. We're not doing that anymore. We're saying, what is the problem? How can we solve it? There's just no point to blame. It just makes people have shame, right? Shame is poison. We don't want that in our organization. 
We learn more. Remember, we're coming back to learning, my central key focal thing that keeps me going, right? I like learning. Okay, so now we learn more, and we become more innovative as we address these problems that come up. And I'm going to leave you with, this, this is compassionate work. And this will make sense to some of you. For me, is what builds trust. Not parlor games. Okay, next, last one, step four, pay it forward. You can do this by being vulnerable with your team, owning when you make mistakes. If the, if the room, so this is part of the reason why I have to like have those five minutes of mindfulness before those meetings, because I have to get all attuned and everything, right? They're all interconnected, okay? So I have to be attuned so that when I go in there, I'm open. Even though I'm coming with a big agenda of all the things I want to do, that's just like talking points. If I'm not going to get my way, that's fine. I'm okay with that because you know what? I work with a lot of really smart, talented people and they often know better, more than me. That's vulnerability, right? So share vulnerability with your team, foster belonging and inclusion. Now, we don't do it that often, but we like to have like get togethers in our school. He's just making it so hard for me to go, let's, let's have a get together. Oh, that dog. <sighs> All right. But that fosters belongingness and inclusion, as does having things like su stuff we develop together, a community agreement, a mission statement, a vision for where we want to be, and taking care of others in your team. And this could be on a variety of different levels, right? So taking care of others. Giving really detailed, comprehensive annual valuations is taking care of your team. Not giving the short shrift and doing what's easy for you. Sometimes I just see a need and I try and fix it. So, a while back, every time I'd walk by, before when I could see in Dr. Kirkland's office, can't see in anymore, so I don't know what she does anymore. Less the doors open, right? I saw this all the time on the, <laughs> on the laptop. And I was like, here's a person that is like really into fitness, really into health, and they should do this all day. This is not good. So I got her a little stand, just a little cheapo stand for her laptop so she wouldn't have to hunch over anymore. And I try and do that now and again with my team, just find out when they might need something gavel, and I just, you know, I deliver on that. All right, <clears throat> so all you really have to do is harness your love for yourself and for the people that you work with, and then you have compassionate leadership, the end. And I'm happy to tell you anything you would ever want to know about spider monkeys, if that wasn't satisfying for you. <laughs> Preguntas? Questions? Discussion points? Just want to go home? Yes, Nick? You say you've been learning a lot. What would you say is maybe over the course of this journey in the past few new vision for that, that one area uh, for solving uh, the challenges that we face, what would you say has surprised you the most? <laughs> no, I'm really curious. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. Well, on the one hand that everybody does it, like I go in with this idea and I'm like, I'm sure this is not the way anyone's used to having their like meetings, right? And so that everybody goes along, and I just, I have no idea, like, do they think I, like, what is she going to do to us this time? I'm like, I'm surprised there's not, like, a lot of attrition in the meetings over the course of the year. Everyone still keeps coming. I think that was one surprise. I'm like, they really do a good job. 
Like, you know, just that, like, that community agreement is brilliant. And then, like, they did something I couldn't even follow. Then Beth made some kind of other connection about, yes, and then we can organize it into assess. And it was like a heuristic, so we can always remember what all those things are. And I was like, assess, huh, what? Because I was just so busy, like, you know, is this going to work? Oh, my God, are they going to, is someone going to trip me on my way to the car after this? Because it was so awkward and uncomfortable. But no, that's what surprises me the most, I think, that everyone does it. I still have this like niggling insecurity like when when I leave the room does everybody go when's this gonna stop like we've had enough screw mindfulness you know that's like I wonder if there's like those like conversations but that's like the old me talking and I really have to just be like another mindfulness lesson I can't have any control over what other people think of me right I can only worry about how I show up for others that's all I do anymore. When I have those thoughts, I push them out. Just go away. That's old call, not new call. Right? Anything else? Yes? In the uh, group mix, um, the problem solving, how do you uh, stay focused on uh, just um, solving the problem and not getting into personalization? So that I find myself um, saying, having to say preemptively, um, now uh, just keep in mind this is not you that I'm referring to. We're talking about the concept. Let's. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't know, what do you do? I'm sure that people are having problems and, and want there to be like justice. Like, Maybe you want me to go talk to someone or whatever about it. But instead, I'm just like, and I'm sure it's annoying. I'm just like, OK, well, how can we solve that problem? And it's like hard for me, too, because I want to like, because that's like that interpersonal relationship part, right, is really engaging and getting into that. But then that becomes bad, right? Because we don't want triangulation. We don't want um, gossiping or any of that. So I have to just be like, hey, how can we solve that? And it's, I'm sure, and, and I'm sure they're going to give up, like, maybe, right? The old habits die hard. But it's just, how can we solve the problem? What's going to fix that? And, so, and it's not like everything is fixable by Colleen's compassionate leadership ideas that she stole from everyone else, okay? It's, it's not, there's going to be, there are going to be people that are always unhappy, that aren't leveraging or bringing their best every day. And those lead to other difficult decisions, right? Like, or other difficult conversations. They're not my decisions, they're their decisions. But sometimes there have to be conversations about, well, well clearly, something's not right. So how can I help you? And it's coming to people like this. As the coach, how can I help you, blah, 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 whatever it is, right? Not, you should be. Why don't you? It's what can I do to help you? Because if I, come, if I come into a lot of those people who, many of them might be the kind of people that are carrying a lot of shame for something, right? Unnecessarily, shame is poison. But people carry a lot of that around. It makes it hard. It makes them hide. It makes them not want to be at work. All of those things. But if we come at it with, instead of, you should, how can I help you do the X, right? That coaching thing takes away any like victimhood kind of, you're trying to pull that out. And I'm not saying these people don't have a right to feel, but that I'm not gonna help by going in like this with all my ideas of how you should do X, but just try to support them to get to that new reality. And if they can't, then maybe this isn't for you. And how can I help you get to the next place that would be better for you? that would make you happier, that would make you want to come to work. And those are, those are that. That's why I'm reading those books by Brene Brown, because she's so good at helping you work through how to have those really tough conversations with people. I don't know if that was any help. Because I'm really not an expert. It takes five years to be an expert, this is year one. I'm like, I don't know what I am, novice. Okay. I'm not going to draw it out painfully because I have to drive to Albuquerque now. Yes? What's the title of that book that you're reading with Brown? 
It's, it's on here somewhere. Where is that slide? What is it called? Dare to lead, that's it. But she's got, they're all good. She's got an arsenal. Dare to lead. Thank you so much.